Welcome to another episode of Dress and Drinks. My name is Leon Webers. I'm an associate professor of costume design at Loyola Marymount University, and I will be your host uh, this afternoon, as always. I would like to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, Kenneth Cohn, um, who is the Director of Museum Studies at the University of Delaware and the Hintz Secretarial Scholar and Curator at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, where he works with a range of pre-1900 collections, including costumes and dress. His award-winning award -winning research on the intersections of race and gender in popular culture and historical memory have appeared in scholarly and popular outlets in print, media, digital, and physical exhibition formats. And as a sidebar for all of those out there, Ken and I used to be colleagues together at St. Mary's College of Maryland. So uh, we are now on opposite ends of our country. Um, so, and our second speaker today is, um, Chloe Chapin. Chloe is a PhD candidate in American Studies at Harvard University with an MA in History and a joint secondary concentration in Gender Studies and Archaeology. She holds an MFA in Design from the Yale School of Drama and an MA in Fashion and Textiles from FIT. Uh, a former professional costume designer, Chloe has taught at FIT, Parsons, and Reed College. She has been the McDowell Fellow and Fulbright Scholar, and her research has been supported by the Weatherhead Institute of Gender Inequity, American Antiquarian Society, and the Winther Library. I'm sorry, Winther, Winterthur Library. It sounds like I've already had a cocktail, and I promise you I haven't. Um, she is currently the Joe and Wanda Korn Fellow at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Smithsonian oh. National Museum of American History. Her dissertation is titled, Full Dress, Masculinity and Conformity in the American Republic. And with that, please welcome and welcome Chloe and Ken to Dress and Drinks. We're so excited that you're here um, and super excited about today's conversation. So let's just uh, start out. Oh, before we do this, um, our cocktail for today, which was sent out, is the Gin Ricky to celebrate Washington, D.C., where the Smithsonian is. <clears throat> Excellent. So Ken already has his going. I have one here. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Um, so a little sip. We're sipping early tonight because it's the end of the semester and, you know, whatnot. Ah, uh, delicious. A big shout out, as always, to Anne Wass, who I'm not sure if she's here today, for the um, for the mocktail recipe that is also will be um, uh, shared in the chat. So thank you all for coming. Super excited about today. Um, okay, so Ken, uh, why don't we have you start off? Is there anything you'd like to say before we dive into the presentation? Uh, just uh, thanks so much for for the invitation and uh, looking forward to the conversation. I think actually Chloe is going to start this off because the way we sort of thought about this is rather than and and you'll see in my slides that there's a number of um, specific uh, uh, costumes and other items in our collections. And so if there's questions about those specific items later or other things, we can we can talk about that afterwards. But our approach here is sort of from Chloe's perspective. Uh, because we are trying at the National Museum of American History uh, to make our collections accessible uh, and to let people know uh, what we have and uh, and you know make that make make that those collections uh, available for study. So uh, from the researcher's perspective, I think Chloe's going to start. Okay, so Ken and I met uh, when I emailed him a year and a half ago now um, when I was thinking about applying to become a Smithsonian Fellow. And my email was slightly longer than this, but it was basically around this theme. And here is basically how I introduced myself. Do you remember how I responded? No, I should have done some research. <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned about what I, anyway, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I can wager a guess. Can I guess? <laughs> so this is how I am legible to other academics, which is that I am a PhD candidate. I'm housing American studies program at Harvard. And here is the topic or the title, a working title of my dissertation. And uh, basically here's what my dissertation is about. And you can see this from the two pictures on the bottom right. So I am looking at the origins of masculine evening dress, the sort of precursor to the tuxedo, the time period um, in between roughly 1820 and 1850, where men start wearing black and white as a separate category of formal wear that is newly called evening dress, 
right as the category of evening dress is being developed. So that's what my uh, dissertation is about. Um, and I was uh, lucky enough to receive the fellowship that Ken helped me to prepare, uh, thanks to his, in part to his uh, feedback on my application. And so I came to the Smithsonian for a whole year looking to do a bunch of research at, across the Smithsonian collections um, around these sort of loose ideas that I have and ways that I am thinking about accessing different kinds of objects in collections. So here's sort of how I am thinking about my own project. I wanna know about this 30 year period. I wanna know what sources are available. I wanna know more about menswear in this period. I wanna know more specifically about American menswear in this period. And here's what I have identified as different types of sources that I might want to look at. So garments is part of them, fashion plates. I come from fashion archives like the FIT archive. Um, I wanna look at all kinds of portraits including drawings, paintings, miniatures, anything that has a picture of a person in it. Um, I'm interested in fashion periodicals, which are related to, but not the same as fashion plates. Um, and then manuscript material like Taylor's account books or diaries that talk about dress or correspondence or all those sort of things. So this is what I come to the Smithsonian with. Ken, just point me towards that collection, right? What can you do? Yeah. How can you help me? Yeah, right. No problem, Chloe. We have all that stuff. It's yeah. just spread across a dozen museums and, you know, multiple divisions, collecting divisions within each of those museums. So, um, you know, what we thought we would do here is sort of talk very briefly uh, for those who are interested in looking at Smithsonian materials about sort of how you navigate um, that complexity. And so, you know, when it comes to uh, collections of, of dress or costume, right, you can think about in, in, in the fashion world or in the specifically costume world, uh, you know, the collection might be organized by the nature of what the dress or the costume is. Um, and so we have some of that, um, but we have that sort of layered in with uh, a sort of social approach to our collection and its organization uh, in which um, different kinds of work or uh, achievement uh, sort of categorizes how a collection is uh, is is set up uh, and and what differentiates one collection from another. And so we end up with a situation where at the American History Museum, and there's something similar to this that goes on at the Portrait Gallery, the African American uh, History and Culture Museum, you know, all of the uh, Smithsonian sort of uh, constellation of museums, they all have sort of thematic organizations and then dresses in all of them. And so sort of how you find the thing you're looking for um, is about sort of looking through the prism of the institution's history to some extent, and then sort of, of course, how you use its online resources. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that like virtually every museum, um, our online catalog is not, is not nearly complete. Um, and so, um, and, and then in addition at the American History Museum, we also have an archive center that has a lot of two-dimensional printed material in all wow. kinds of forms that holds that that relates to all of these different um, uh, thematic categories. So they don't have any garments in the archive center, but they have all the kinds of printed material that Chloe was talking about wanting as well. In addition to some of that material being spread across uh, the various collecting divisions uh, and the other museums in the Smithsonian. So one of the things that we were thinking to do here is not uh, give everyone a speech about how to find menswear research right. um, project, but really to think about this gulf that exists between researcher questions and archivist organizational principles and how uh, institutionally specific those organizational principles are. And so for those of you who are in the audience who are researchers thinking about how to think like a, an archivist, and maybe for those of you who come from the museum or archival perspective, uh, understanding more about the kinds of research questions that the researchers are going to have when they come to you and sort of filling the, being a translator bridge in between the two of those. 
Yeah, and they, there's there's really good metaphors here, right? Some is like translator bridge, other is like networker, because a lot of this is about finding the right person. I say this, of course, I know Nancy Davis is in the room, so um, you know, finding the right people and 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 folks that that know that institution are, is really important. Leon, were you about to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that this actually, the way that you're mapping this out seems like researching at the Smithsonian is far more complicated than, say, a standalone museum like LACMA or the Met or uh, or the V&A. It's like there are multiple layers happening here in this way. I would say yeah. that places there are multiple layers and at the Smithsonian there's like multiple, multiple layers in multiple dimensions. <laughs> Wait, so since I, I get to use this reference again, so right now, because we are all in this little mirror, we're all like this the evil villains being floating away in space at the end of Superman 1. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> totally. That's, that's, <laughs> okay. Need to think dimensionally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, a lot of this has to do with sort of the history of the Smithsonian. And so uh, this is actually, actually, this slide is even better because this is uh, a sort of sense of sort of how that maze can work depending on what you're looking for. So on the, the top left, we have a, a U.S. Air Force Airman First Class Summer Service Uniform from 1964. That's in our military history collection. Uh, second across the line, smiling at you, is uh, Tony Curtis, of course. Uh, 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 in his sponsoring role for Van Heusen uh, in the summer of 1955, um, followed by, I thought this one was particularly appropriate, a uh, vaccine t-shirt for getting your swine flu vaccine in 1976. And that is in our medicine and science uh, division. And in fact, T-shirts are everywhere at the Museum of American History. So, um, you know, wow. it's, it's, a, it's thematic, right? So the, the military uniform obviously is in the military history collection, but the advertisement is in the archives center uh, and the content of the T-shirt uh, uh, for the swine flu, uh, you know, makes it something that was acquired by the uh, medicine and science uh, division. So then, uh, so there's some, some garments too, of course, uh, some, some older garments. Uh, so here you have uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's, uh, one of Abraham Lincoln's office suits. Uh, this one dates to, to 1864. Um, that belongs to our political history division, which might make sense because Abraham Lincoln was a president, of course. Uh, the one on the right is uh, a suit uh, that was worn by Benjamin Franklin. Now, you might think that that also could belong to the political history uh, collection. Uh, but that actually is in our what we now call uh, community life and our, our our actual costume costume collection. Um, and then this is a um, uh, a union jacket that belonged to Cesar Chavez, which you might think could belong in in political history as well. Uh, but that's in our work and industry division. So again, stuff is everywhere. Um, and so, uh, you know, try, these are all items that are sort of findable and, and searchable because they're, they're pretty well known, the ones that are showing on the screen right now. Uh, but the ones that were, that were shown earlier are slightly more obscure and those can be harder to find online. And so, again, knowing which division you're a part of, uh, which, which division your uh, materials might relate to, um, is is going to be a little bit helpful in terms of uh, trying to navigate and and find what you're looking for, I think. So I have a question. So yeah. um, within this these divisions, how much overlap and and cross pollinization or communication exists? So if you come in and you're like, oh, I want to look at the Caesar Chavez thing, um, but I'm over in the American you know history thing, like. Can you can you like can you call it up like at the Library of Congress and be like, oh, the the jacket will be here in two hours, kind of thing. <laughs> Not quite that quickly, um, but it is true that you know if you're you know even if you're not on fellowship like Chloe, right? Even if you're just coming in for two weeks, right? If you uh, you know if you see something on a visit with one curator that makes you think about something else and you ask about it. Right, we can put in requests and uh, and and try to get you to see the other the other uh, item in another division um, pretty easily. It's just a matter of sort of finding a, a time window. But the same person who is showing you something in one division probably doesn't have access to the storage room of the other division where the other item might be. And so that's where the networking really is is important. 
So how did it get this way, right? So this is a little bit about how the costume collections evolved uh, at the Smithsonian. And it starts with a lot of the really famous people. So this is um, Abraham Lincoln's uh, silk plush top hat, which he was wearing uh, the night of his assassination at Ford's Theater. Um, and this, like many of our early costume materials, actually came to the Smithsonian from the patent office. So the patent office collected a bunch of sort of items from notable people in American history and actually had them on display before the Smithsonian had an operating museum. Uh, and then later the patent office gives a bunch of that stuff to the Smithsonian once it actually opens a museum. The Smithsonian actually started as a purely research entity. Uh, and there were very high powered people at the top of the institution who didn't want a museum, didn't want public facing material and content. They just wanted to go out and do their research. And so um, as the sort of public facing stuff develops over the course of the mid to late 19th century uh, and, and the US National Museum opens the first sort of Smithsonian museum that housed everything. The, the beginnings of the stuff at natural history, the beginnings of the stuff at American history, um, that was all in uh, the original U.S. National uh, Museum building that opened in 1881. And so uh, in, oh. in, in that era, the patent office sort of dropped off a bunch of this stuff and said, oh, you guys have an actual museum. Here, take this. <laughs> like we always want. So I'm just to sort of be right. like, I've got Abe Lincoln's hat here. Could you just use this? Can, is this? Is this an okay thing? Like right, that's... exactly. So, this is amazing. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about this hat? Because it looks awesome. I mean, it's is it beaver? It looks like it's no, beaver. No, this this one's actually silk plush. So, um, in the as you some folks here probably know, so better than me, I'm I'm like masquerading as a costume historian here. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, I've I've studied several of the. Uh, of uh, the ensembles in the Smithsonian collection, but uh, along with a bunch of other early American content. Um, but anyway, so the the uh, hat material sort of shifts partly partly as the beaver has been hunted to extermination in in, in many places. Um, but the the material shifts from beaver fur to silk uh, to sort of plushed or felted silk um, over the course of the 1840s and 1850s. So this one is silk actually, and then there's a mourning band. Uh, that is still on the hat. Uh, Lincoln was still wearing the mourning band from uh, from his son's death. Yeah, so, so that comes to the Smithsonian's uh, collections. They actually don't put it on display. You know, DC is right on that line between North and South. And in the wake of his assassination in the end of the Civil War, um, the Smithsonian, as, it, as was true for, for 30 or 40 years, uh, after the Civil War uh, was very attentive to Southerners and to white supremacy in, in lots of ways, um, as, as our current secretary, Lonnie Bunch, has, has pointed out himself. Um, so, uh, you know, so they actually, this thing doesn't go on display until uh, the end of the century, 1893, 1895. Oh, wow. So the Smithsonian got it and they were like, ooh, touchy subject, too soon. <laughs> not not going to touch that. That's that's just amazing, and what uh, it's just I'm I'm a little speechless at, like at seeing this object. I've never seen this object. It's really fascinating. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's got great wear, and it's actually been really useful. And several of our co older collections, uh, costume collections, have been useful in this way. So the uh, Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield, Illinois, acquired a hat and said, "Oh, we got a Lincoln hat too." And a bunch of experts who had studied our hat, and there's one other confirmed former Lincoln hat that's at a museum in in Vermont. Um, and they went, they went out and looked at this hat and we were like, we're not so sure about that. So you can, you can Google and read, uh, about the controversy of the, uh, Lincoln Presidential Museum and Library's, uh, hat acquisition. Wow. But they were using, they were comparing that one to this one, which has a maker's tag on the inside. Um, and of course has really good provenance since it came basically on the, the night after the assassination. Uh, to the to the patent office, and then the patent office straight to us. So uh, another early one, uh, a bunch of George Washington stuff, in, including this. I put uniform in quotes here uh, because this wasn't uh, a piece. This wasn't a whole ensemble that was a, that was designed uh, and worn uh, together originally. So the coat is much later. The coat is from 1789, um, which uh, of course is the, the year of his inauguration. 
uh, president uh, being commander in chief. And actually, Washington mustered the troops outside of Philadelphia uh, prior to the Whiskey Rebellion uh, in 1793, probably wearing this coat. Um, but Link, but but uh, Washington also was the subject of a bunch of portraits um, later in life, and so. Um, there is some documentation to suggest he actually commissioned the jacket to for for sittings for portrait sittings, and then the breeches and the waistcoat are original to the Revolutionary period. The boots are completely not historic; they're repros that were put on the mannequin in order to make it look uh, of a of a piece. <laughs> Same with the the ruffled shirt. So okay, so we get a bunch of famous people's stuff from the Patent Office, including the Washington stuff you saw. Um, the beginnings of what we might call sort of social history of dress collections um, that, that look at dress a little bit more broadly, still not super broadly, um, is with the Cop family collection that comes to the museum uh, in the late 1880s uh, and is displayed in the 1890s. Um, and this is intended to display sort of average colonists wear um, in the eight, long 18th century, let's say, because the dates that, that were used uh, when this stuff was put on display in the 1890s to the 1910s were not super accurate. Um, and so um, the cop collection includes a bunch of domestic materials that aren't just uh, costume and dress materials. Um, but so, so that's sort of the beginnings of, okay, these people may not particularly be famous. They're still relatively well off. They tended to be Northern or even New England. Um, but, uh, but, you know, a, a little bit broader compass. Um, and then of course you get, um, sort of the beginnings of the, uh, of the first ladies exhibit, uh, in 1912 to 1914, the exhibit opens in 1914 and people always forget. So I am not a specialist in the first ladies gowns, so I'll be very careful with questions that are asked. But what I will say is, um, people often forget that the, the first ladies exhibit which is one of the most popular things at the at the American History Building today, and has been for generations, really. Um, it starts off as a general period costume exhibit, of which the First Lady stuff was just one little bit. And actually, the beginnings of our theater and pop culture costume collection, which is where I have a little bit more expertise and have spent a lot of time working, um, the origins of that collection are in this historical. Uh, are in this historical period. Um, so on the right here, you have uh, Richard Mansfield's costume uh, from the title role of Don Carlos uh, in the 1890s uh, at the Mansfield Theater. Um, and then a costume worn by Minnie Mattern Fisk uh, in the role of Becky Sharp in the 1915 silent uh, film version of Vanity Fair. Um, and both of these costumes were acquired to go into the same exhibit as the First Ladies they were acquired as historically accurate costumes to the period they were representing. So the Smithsonian acquires Mansfield's stuff and says, oh, this is great. This is like a 17th century costume. Oh, this is great. This is Becky Sharp. That's a, you know, a Regency period gown. Excellent. Um, and the, the curatorial records sort of are, are explicit about this, that they are taking these items for their historical value and because they were so accurate historically. And then as in, included in these, on the back end of this sort of uh, theater binge that comes in in the 1890s to 1910s is a costume piece that I've worked pretty extensively with, uh, which is Charlotte Cushman's costume for the role of Cardinal Woolsey uh, in Henry VIII. Um, and we can talk more about this piece or any of these if folks are interest, interested later. But Cushman's materials also sort of come in as historically accurate uh, materials that then go uh, go on display. This one actually has has never been on display, uh, and we can talk about sort of the gender bendingness of the role as to as to why we can speculate uh, as to as to why that might be. Um, her uh, gown for Catherine for the role of Catherine in the exact same uh, play um, does go on display in the historical uh, period costume uh, exhibit from uh, about 1914. Uh, until uh, the 1930s. So in the 1930s, curators, a new generation of curators come in and go, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, these theater pieces are not historically accurate, even though, as it turns out, the uh, lace rocher here on the, um, on the Woolsey gown does turn out to be 16th century Milanese. Uh, Cushman lived outside of Rome 
and went shopping for pieces to complement her ensembles in Italy. So there, there are actually historical elements here. It's thrown onto 19th century um, cotton, uh, cotton border to sort of keep it, um, uh, keep it stiff as she sort of wraps it around the the apron of the uh, of the gown here. But, um, but. Uh, so anyway, so 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 these things are taken as historically accurate. In the 1930s, people start to say, "Way maybe that's not the way this should go." Uh, and so then the museum tries to offload all these things. Um, they try, yes, and people are saying amazing lace. So actually, while I'm talking about the costumes in general, I, I just want to say I love this yeah. notion of like 16th century lace. Oh, it's vintage. I'll just go grab this as, yes. as, as if you're like. <laughs> running down to the vintage store to grab something right and i mean of course she might not have known it was it was 16th century but like what did that come off of is what i want to know people were commenting on the lace so i wanted you all to get a close-up i'm trying to please the crowd um so yes val no problem um so uh so in the 1930s the curators say wait a minute this stuff isn't accurate we need to get rid of it uh and so they try to send it to the museum of the city of new york of course, which has an outstanding theater collection already by then. Um, right. And the stuff is like boxed up and ready to go. The curatorial records, the correspondence on this is clear. The stuff is crated and ready to ship. And uh, the descendants of Mansfield and uh, Fisk and Cushman start writing letters to the Smithsonian saying, we hear you're getting rid of our ancestor stuff. We don't <laughs> think that's appropriate. And the, 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 the director of the museum at the time, um, Remington Kellogg was his name, uh, sort of backs down and writes a letter to the curators and says, this is gonna be a publicity nightmare if we give this stuff away, we're gonna keep it. Which for a while doesn't change anything, it just takes up place in storage. But in the 1970s, as the study of pop culture and entertainment start to take off, Curators actually want to go out and collect this stuff. And then they use these collections as a rationale for saying, look, we've already got some material, uh, right? So then they say, oh, well, you know, we can go get Fonzie's jacket from Happy Days. We can go get, uh, you know, the C-3PO costume. And of course, much more recently, Lin-Manuel Miranda's costume from the second act of, of Hamilton. Um, so, so now our entertainment collection is a burgeoning collecting area for the museum, but really, we have to thank the curators uh, who in the 1970s sort of saw this stuff that had been in storage and hadn't been used in 50, 60 years and sort of used it as a rationale to start building a, a larger collection. That's amazing. Well, and it really makes a lot of sense because by this time, the, the notions of American culture you know, you're 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 capturing the sort of material culture of of American culture versus just simply the films or simply the books or et cetera, et cetera. So um, that you're actually capturing the things that the or the or the or the actors diaries or things of that nature. That's right. And so, you know, today, our most recent visitor studies from before the pandemic, of course, um, you know, show that about 80 percent of visitors, if you ask them what the top three things are that they're coming to the museum to see. 80% of visitors in that top three lists one of our pop culture items. Kermit the Frog or one of the Muppets. We have a very large Muppet collection. Henson, of course, uh, went to the University of Maryland and, and uh, was from not, not far away uh, from DC. Um, uh, and, uh, and then you know some of these other uh, costume materials uh, from Star Wars, the ruby slippers, of course, all of those uh, items are r ranked pretty highly on folks' awareness lists. Chloe, so what? Do, none of this helps you with researching formal wear, though. No, but it does help position the institution across research categories so that I, as the researcher, then can start to ask not, um, like, do you have these materials that I'm looking for? but who should I talk to if I was interested in X topic or X material? Um, like yeah. uh, at the American Art Museum, one of the things that's interesting is that some of the curatorial jobs are about materials and some are about time periods and some, some are about artist subjectivity. So there are the people in charge of paintings or sculptures or time-based media and then there's the people who do like 18th century early America or 19th century or like 
20th century contemporary, so it's all time period based. And then there are the people who do Latinx art or Afro-American art. Um, and so the different curatorial positions also focus on different organizational categories. So you as the researcher have to be incredibly nimble in terms of just asking who to talk to. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, and you know, I think it's our hope that that curators will help do that a little bit because we know each other. Um, and so, you know, um, I think it's our hope that that curators can help facilitate that. But the other thing to help you facilitate that is the the interface stuff. And I, you know, I don't want to make this a a talk about sort of how you search the collections. <laughs> I, I we can, <laughs> um, which is always the bane of our existence when we're looking for something. It's always so difficult searching for things when, that you're wanting to find. Yes, uh, and so you know, for us, you know, there's this this large collections .si .edu. You can look within each of the museums. They each have their own search interfaces, uh, but this is sort of the centralized one. Um, and then I think actually in the translation of this slide, so if you if you search for Fonzie's jacket or Arthur Fonzarelli, or as you can see here where the highlight was, I searched by Winkler, you can um, click on, uh, you, you know, uh, cultural and community life down there, which is the division within the museum. This is the blue hot link that's like, you know, three quarters of the way down the list there. That's the, the curatorial division that has this item. So then you can go to the staff lists, and I put the URL here, and you can click on uh, the, the Office of Cultural, uh, the Division of Cultural and Community Life, which is second down from the top under the Office of Curatorial Affairs, and you'll get a list of curators. And you can read about who does stuff related either to the time period uh, or to the medium that you're interested in. And that's sort of how you can try to narrow your search and, and find the person. And this is particularly challenging right now, um, as again, you know, Nancy Davis is with us here. Um, Nancy Davis is our curator emerita of the costume collection, um, but we don't at the moment, the, the replacement hire, newsflash for folks interested, um, is in the pipeline, but has not yet been announced. Um, so, um, you know, not quite sure what the Smithsonian sort of HR timeline is for that, but we will be hiring to replace that curator, but we don't have somebody who is full-time present in the museum uh, in charge of the costume collection right now, which can make this kind of searching particularly difficult. Yeah, and you guys have such an amazing collection of this stuff. I mean, I was very privileged to visit you there and just being able to talk with you about the objects that you told me that you have in the collection was just amazing. Um, and, to, and to think about the vast array of entertainment costumes you have um, from television, film, theater, uh, vaudeville. I mean, it's just, it's really amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's not comprehensive, so folks, you know, need to be aware, um, you know, but we do have very broad representation of forms of entertainment, um, and we're working on diversifying uh, the content from the performer perspective. It's still an overwhelmingly white collection right now. Um, and in fact, if you go back to, to curatorial records, you know, as you can imagine from earlier in the 20th century, um, you know, there are, are, are um, you know, discussions that are very, that are very um, racist about sort of that, that, um, that reality. Um, and so, you know, we're, it's interesting, um, my colleagues at the African American Museum of History and Culture, um, you know, uh, opened the museum in um, in 2015, and um, you know we're able to sort of build that museum from the bottom up. Um, and I often say our our building, if you if you look at the the American History Building, you know we have this sort of super modern squat building that sort of lays down on the ground. And so we you know changing changing inside this building takes uh, you know energy and takes time. And so we're 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 trying to make those strides. Tell us about the objects in this slide. Oh yeah, so uh, so this is from opening day of the Hall of American Costume in 1964, when the building on the right, the, the current American History Building, opened. So you had that 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 building uh, from the 1880s, um, that was the first U.S. museum, and then they opened the Natural History Museum. So they take all the natural history stuff out and they put it in that museum, and then the next 
museum that they open is this one, which is uh, at the time it's called the Museum of History and Technology. It was uh, like a Cold War effort to show how uh, how more how much more progressive America was than its uh, than its communist foes. Uh, and so um, so a lot of the exhibits were about sort of showing uh, greater comfort in living over time, uh, the power of consumerism, all of that. Um, and so the Hall of American Costume is an exhibition space that is entirely devoted to the to the uh, costume collection uh, in the community. What's now the Community Life Division. Um, and so th this is from the uh, 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 19th century section of that uh, of that exhibition. Wow. So our our exhibition I... techniques have modernized a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the questions is, did the Smithsonian sell anything to the Academy Museum, which opens later this year? So the Smithsonian doesn't typically sell collections to other museums. We do periodically, of course, like all museums, we do cull our collections, uh, but we uh, often gift them to other museums that have related collections. So we might in future, at some distant time, gift something to the Academy Museum, but that has not happened, uh, and we certainly didn't sell them anything. Although I, we've been in touch with their curators uh, throughout the development, and in fact, we were supposed to do uh, a great conference panel together uh, that got canceled by by COVID uh, um, back last summer. So that was that was disappointing, but we're very excited to see their final product when it opens. Um, excellent. There's another question that is 17 million. I'm assuming that's a comment about the the uh, on the splash page for the search center. That's right, 17 million records, and that is only a fraction of the Smithsonian's collections. So again, remember that what you're searching isn't complete, and you, there may be variations or other things that are relevant to you. And actually, one thing I was going to say about those records, and this is pertains to you, Chloe, that I can't remember if we've actually talked about. I feel like everything we should talk about in front of all these people should be something that you and I have actually discussed before. But like accession records are uh, so useful for thinking about the use of an item. Even, I mean, costume stuff, I mean, um, entertainment costume stuff, of course, because you get the, per the performer's perspective and all of that. Um, but even in our social history collections, what comes in with those collections in terms of the letters from the collectors, um, or people whose ancestors had worn that item can be really insightful. And that stuff doesn't get cited often enough. Now, it's a little harder sometimes, depending on the collection, there can be restrictions on, ex on access to um, accession records. But this is something I would definitely encourage people to look at because it doesn't get cited enough. And as a curator who does have access to those things, not just at the Smithsonian, but at other museums, you can find real gems in archival research about a costume or an item that you'd never find anywhere else. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. if you had to take a stab in the dark, how many records do you think are at the Smithsonian, Smithsonian in total? Oh, man. I don't even want to hazard because I'm afraid I would say something and then it'll be on YouTube forever for how wrong I was. Um, I don't... It's, it's millions and millions. Uh, and then, because, you know, you're talking about not just... I mean, it depends what you call a record, right? An entire file as a record, uh, an item as a record. There's there's all sorts of uh, different ways to sort of uh, come to that number, but uh, yeah. more than 17 million for sure. Yeah, we have another question that is, can you speak to how cataloging and taxonomy practices will or might be changing as a move away from uh, quote, problematic 19th century language and marginalized- Awesome question. People? This Great. is great. and. I love this question because it sort of gets to my transition as I'm as I'm working both at the Smithsonian and actually teaching a collections management course uh, at the University of Delaware right now, where we're building a catalog and and trying to sort of um, encourage students to think about um, you know new taxonomies and nomenclature systems uh, that are more equitable and that are community centered that use the the language of the community from which the object comes from as opposed to curatorial imposition of that categorizing language. So that's that's a fabulous question. If there's a burgeoning literature about that and it is probably one of the most important topics right now in the in the museum field in my opinion. So thank you for raising it. 
Well, and that brings up another question. So Costume Society of America has two, um, you know, I talk, I've talked about this several times, has two um, programs, the Digital Angels, as well as uh, we're developing, a, we're in the process, it's really the nascent stages of a searchable portal for things. And one of the big issues in the field is nomenclature and taxonomy and, and how large institutions have established a system of their own and they're all different and and then they sort of come down. even even within the smithsonian so we are working on uh standardizing this i don't even think we're working on it smithsonian wide but we're working on it within the american history museum um like so in military parlance there is no such thing as a hat so right. if you search for a hat in this catalog you will get top hats you will get costume uh, entertainment costume hats you will not find any military helmets or military hats. They call that headgear. So, you know, the differences there make it hard, even in the online, even in the stuff that has online records, to necessarily find all the right things that you're looking for. So that's right. Yeah, splitting those hairs is really important. And then, and then coming up with standardized language, you know, ideally uh, that all of us are using. Yes. It's one of our goals of, of 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 the portal project is is trying to sort of bring this language together and as a way so that it's much more easily searchable and easy to find um, when one is doing research. Whether you're a scholar or uh, you know a community member who just wants to know what their great grandfather wore in whatever time period, you know. Exactly, that, which is the most important thing we can do, right? That kind right. of work is so important because it hooks somebody in. What you think about is um, the position of the curator within what kind of institution, right? So there are fashion curators that exist mostly in art museums, and then there are dress curators that exist mostly in history museums. <laughs> right. But, you know, like as CSA has talked about, the difference between what we call fashion, dress, clothing, apparel, costume, et cetera, uh, is very different and in a way very personal and it changes. It's a, you know, it goes through fashions, ironically. Um, and so the, the nomenclature, even just of what it is that we do as, what is it that we wanna say? Like fashion historians, dress studies. Totally. People. I'm constantly yeah. navigating what it is that I even want to call yes. myself, what word to use, because fashion is very alienating to certain people. You just sort of lose a whole audience by saying that F word. This is why Costume Society, we use the word costume, because it encompasses so much stuff. We have these long debates about that word and what it means um, in, in, you know, within the society itself. The next one that I saw was, um, what is the to die for? Uh, oh, gosh. Oh, my yeah. goodness, Susan. Um, <laughs> there's there's a lot. And this is a product rather Can than an answer. Here, actually, Ken, yes. before you start? Because I think the question is more important than the question. <laughs> that makes any sense. Which is, as a researcher who has done archival research in lots of institutions across the world, one of the things that is the most helpful is when an institution has a description of their collection and tells you what some of the highlights are. Because it's impossible to know as a researcher who doesn't care about the collection, they care about the research question, but the, the, the collections are often so siloed and the archivists often know a lot of their own collection, but little about other collections unless they have transferred from another place. So like, for instance, if I was doing research on armor, like what are the best armor museums in the world? If I was doing research on 19th century American entertainment, well, who are the best collections for that? And what's the best part of your collection? Where are you strong? Where are you not, What? where are, you know, there are other strengths. And we just don't have that kind of network 
that researchers have access to or can read without insider information about those things. That's such a great point, right? What, something that AAM could do, right? <laughs> the American Alliance of Museums, uh, as if they're not busy enough. Uh, but uh, right, they could come up with these with a, some sort of format for a collection guide. I just feel like there's no way anything like that could be, um, you know, accurate enough to help a lot of people. You know, right? So if well, you're I'm interested in, there are go ahead. A number museums that do have this sort of description where they'll say, here's our dress collection, here's where most of the collection is focused. So if right. you so do research here, here's what you should look at. Because for me, when I go to do archival research, I have two questions. One is, why am I coming to see you? So that's my research question that I come from, that I say, this is what I'm looking for. Hopefully you'll have like at least something for me to find. But then my second question is, so now that I'm here, what should I right. see? Right. That's right. Because as a researcher, I often, I always, especially as a you know costume person, I always have 47 other questions that I care about that is not like the subject of my dissertation, but that I might eventually care about or just like want to see because when else am I going to see Abraham Lincoln's top hat or whatever? So right. having the highlights or you know 10 featured objects or you know especially the the smaller museums are often very good at doing that and it is so yes. useful. Even that's a. But you just made a great distinction about why that happens at smaller, it happens at smaller museums. Right. I mean, I feel like any way that we were to, any way that we would do that, we would be shortchanging some division, some top, there's so, each division has its own, like, so, um, you know, the Arthur Fonzarelli jacket uh, and our outstanding collection of 18th and early 19th century waistcoats, are not in the same, they are in the same division, but not in the same collection. And so like, I mean, I could give you 10 beautifully embroidered or um, intricately woven uh, waistcoats alone, uh, depending on sort of what your interest is. And that's why sort of when I was sort of went through the list below about sort of trying to find the right curator said to send the email to, um, that's, that's important, but it's just as important to sort of follow up with whoever you sent or try somebody else because as long as you don't get somebody who's sort of on vacation or on research leave or something like that um you know hopefully they'll put you in touch with all with with, with other people there's just so many people in so many collections one well, other sort of thing that i think we should put in conversation with the taxonomy question is search functions on the website because some museum collections are much more user friendly than those like being able yeah. to search oldest to newest or you know by material or that kind of stuff really is so much more user friendly rather than collections friendly well and that yeah. stuff is actually super collections friendly too go ahead um, we can come back to that in a second go ahead leon no yeah, i was just gonna say what it sounds clearly like you're what you're asking for is some as, akin to a lot a lib guide you know like here's the highlight of this moment and uh but then how if you have such a vast collection like the smithsonian which which ones do you leave out because you know what what's the cream of the crop of the smithsonian how do you make that choice and you're never going to want to go research somewhere if you don't know why you should go research there yes that's right that's right Okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Val is saying uh, UX design is important, uh, but which you? Uh, and so every this is a this is the ongoing debate in the disciplines. Yes. That we, that, so it's really it's a it's a really challenging thing. And once it's solved, if it's ever solved, will like the whole world will open up in a really profound way. Um, so but to 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 get back to that, I think that's absolutely right, and and that sort of relates back to the to die for question, which I, I read similarly to the way Chloe read, but not exactly, which is rather than like tell you the things that I wish we could collect that we probably won't be able to, or that I won't be able to. Um, what I wanna say is that, you know, the, 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 the things to die for uh, are, um, you know, a broader range of people seeing themselves in and using our collections, right? And so what can we collect that will invite a better user experience or more people to be interested in the collection, right? 
I'm going to make a second plug here. So it's not just what you can collect. Absolutely, I agree 100%. It's also how can you make it more accessible to people? So breaking down right. breaking down that map barrier um, at the beginning. So is is how do you make it so people can go in and do this? This is questions that you know my partner Monica Sklar and us at CSA who are working on the digitization pro the Digital Angels project and the Portal project. These are the questions we're grappling with. Arden Kirkland is part of that as well. Like how do we make these things more accessible so you can research around and use the correct terminology and the correct and the correct um, ways of getting into it. Because if, on a simple search, like if you go to select a museum now, and and you know do put something in their search engine, you're gonna be like, why is this in the Asian history? Why is this in the Asian collection? Right. You know why 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 are these you know these shoes in the Asian in the Asian history collection when they should be in the textile collection? And and do they talk to each other? Do they know how to even interpret that? So so these are really big questions, and you know, and we're just hitting this I think critical mass moment where there's so much technology that's available to us. Yeah. So many things can do and we're all just and we and we need to make our collections more accessible online to people but you know but simplicity or not yeah but sim simplicity is really important and so is you know what they what they say in the in the digital humanities world as generous interfaces yes. right so that so that so that the coding in your search functions pulls all the quote unquote clothing when you put in costume Right, so that so that there that that is built into the design, so that the design doesn't expect you to be perfect. The design is generous with your searching and gives you a more robust range. Um, the Smithsonian hasn't, you know, doesn't have that at the moment. There there right. are projects afoot on that, um, but there are there are some museums that that you know did put that time into that, and so you know. The question is, you know, there there are limited resources for everybody. So where do you put it, right? Because some people want to put it in the beautiful photography that you see here, right? Right. Some people want to put it in because that's also a kind of access, right? You get a three dimensional no notion of what plus close ups or high res that allows you to zoom in and see close ups for stitching uh, and tailoring. So you know, it's just you know, where do you put your resources? Um, but you're certainly right. This also uh, has to do with the the labor of the curators that go into this. Like uh, for people in a painting or prints collection, you can basically hand those objects over to the photographer and get a pretty accurate representation without a whole lot of ne negotiation from the curator perspective. But with dress, you've got to dress that mannequin to show it off. And so you need the curator and the conservator and the mannequin dressers. And that's a whole lot of extra labor that this department yes. needs to have access to in order to do the same kind of digitization work as other collections. That That is absolutely right. That's absolutely right. I mean, which isn't to say you can't do a good, like I'm always concerned about saying stuff like that, Chloe, because I'm afraid people at small museums or with small collections will hear that and be like, oh, we got to go do that. Like some quality imagery is better than none right so if you if you have to photograph your costume collection flat i don't have a problem with that give me front and back and will you start there um because you know everything you've just said is is right in terms of resources i'm going to throw a shout out to my costume designer friends in the audience because one of the things that we are trained in doing, even though we, you know, are do not have PhDs, one of the things that we are trained in doing is knowing historical undergarments all the way throughout history and knowing <laughs> what those silhouettes are. I'm a, I'm very much and very proud to be a generalist. So you want to talk about a hoop skirt or a bustle or you know a long line corset and what that silhouette's supposed to be, like that's where that's that's our area of expertise is that general knowledge in that way. Um, and being able to replicate that um, in some way. So, so we're we're so yeah. So reach out to your friends who are costume designers. They probably know. Just be, just be careful with the historic stuff, right? So this one, this Catherine gown, which is um, oh. definitely one of my favorite pieces. Um, so the the velvet, of course, in the period was tr thoroughly treated with arsenic, right? So totally. <laughs> which is why it's mostly brown now. 
Yes, and that and and but that's also indicative of all entertainment throughout time. It is not a historical garment right. of accuracy. It's a historical yeah. garment of entertainment. So that's where it is. So you know, most of us who have students are like, no, please don't go look at that film for historical accuracy. <laughs> as go to the museum. To <laughs> go to the museum. <laughs> um, right jump in here in case there's anyone listening who is interested in coming to the Smithsonian to do research that's another thing that you have to negotiate like you know when you make an appointment at the Victoria and Albert Museum to look at their dress collection you are allotted a certain number of hours and that is all you get no matter who you are no matter where you're coming from and you are not allowed to touch anything even if you're wearing gloves like it's very strict guidelines but then you go you know to the manor house out in the middle of the country and they're happy to like spend all day there and like open boxes and take you back into storage and like dig through things and you can open the collars and look at the inside so if you want to come to the smithsonian what are the like how does someone who isn't a year-long fellow how does an outside person oh, actually yeah. make an appointment how many like, how yeah. much time do you get that how many objects do you get to look at yeah. So, uh, I mean, we, that's part of our job description uh, is serving those those uh, requests. So, um, you know, there's a new book out about Charlotte Cushman uh, and the author visited um, about a year and a half ago to look at the collection items. So, I mean, it's just an email and then finding a, a date and time that works. Um, uh, theoretically, uh, the, the curator is supposed to serve the need of the of the researcher. So if you want to be there all day, I will block off a day and we'll look at the costume very carefully. Now you won't be alone with the costume and you definitely won't be alone in storage um, ever. And you will definitely need gloves. We, we supply those um, so you don't need to bring your own. Depending on the nature of the material, even with gloves, folks may or may not let you touch the material depending on, on, on what it is. So those kinds of things sort of vary based on the fragility of the item, uh, the uniqueness of the item, um, and uh, and the expertise and experience of the researcher, uh, but uh, we spend you know you know a, a, as much time as you need to spend with with the collection. You can call on people. Sometimes it'll be the the curator. Sometimes it might be a collection manager who helps um, uh, who helps on a day to day basis uh, take care of the collections. Uh, but but you know we'll we'll manage your request. I mean I had we had somebody um, in the same division with the entertainment costumes. Our actual um, music items, uh, music instruments. And we have a collection uh, of several hundred pianos, uh, which are stored off site going back to the earliest. Well, we've got harpsichords actually from like Austria and stuff, but, um, but, but uh, a whole range of Steinways that came out of the Steinway factory in New York. Um, and there was a researcher doing a book on Steinway and we all had to, he was there for basically a week and a half. And we all, so we all had to sign up for a day and just sort of rotate through. So we each took a day and spent the day while he was going through the, the pianos. So, you know, we'll, we'll accommodate as needed because, you know, these are public collections and, and we try to make them as available to researchers as possible. Um, okay, so I have one last question since we're on this slide. Um, I love this image of Charlotte Cushman, and um, however, the image on the on the form is not the same. It's not the same garment as in the picture. So, can you talk about that? Yeah, it's not the same, uh, largely because I don't think the photographer in the photographer studio. I, I I don't know that she was necessarily in her costume, or the costume may have changed over time. Anyway, the the shawl you see on the on the left. <laughs> <laughs> so the shawl you see on the left um, was listed in our catalog as being part of the cardinal's robes that I showed you earlier. They're ma it's made of the same material, it's the same color. Um, but it was pretty clear from the border of the material and the very um, sort of classical brooch, um, one of which is missing, the left one is missing. There's um, uh, thread left where it was attached, where it was sewn on, um, but the, the right one is still there. Um, it was it was clear that, that that was probably not actually part of the same costume, just just cut literally from the from the same cloth, um, and so we start we started doing some work again. So it's great to sort of talk about this at the end uh, after Chloe talked about our conservation and mounting team because that's who I worked with here. Uh, so I took it downstairs and and I was like, okay, this thing probably doesn't go with the cardinal outfit. What is this? So our first attempt was what you see on the right which I don't think was right. <laughs> but we just, we spent like a day and a half trying to figure out how this could hang right. 
Um, and then I, we were sort of drifting towards a kind of shawl um, uh, with a hood. Uh, and I came across the photo, which was done at the end of her career uh, in the 1870s uh, as Lady Macbeth. Uh, and so although not the exact same item, uh, I suspect that this was a stage piece um, and that for any one of a number of reasons, it wasn't the item that was actually used in the photograph, which we know the carte de visite photos of the actors did not always picture them in the actual costumes they wore on stage for all sorts of reasons. I want to thank you both so much for your time today and for coming and sharing your expertise and your backgrounds um, about the Smithsonian and Chloe, your experience of researching at the Smithsonian. Um, this is great information and a really robust conversation about not only the collection, but collecting. Um, and so with this, I want to say thank you both for you, uh, for your time and your effort. And to the audience, please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram to make sure that you hear about all of our upcoming episodes in the Conversation on Dress series. Thank you for your time and for joining us today. It was such a great pleasure. Great to see you again, Ken. Great to chat with you, Chloe. Looking forward to more in the future. Um, and with that, thank you all uh, and have a great weekend.